Hi everyone, I'm Sarah and I'm here tonight to wow and amaze you with some equations that you'll only half see as they fly by. Are you ready? Okay, well, so there have already been a whole lot of stuff models published for the Tohoku earthquake. And as you can see, they're all a little different. And that's because this is a fundamentally underdetermined inverse problem. There is more than one model which fits the data. There's always going to be more than one model that fits the data. And I say to you, embrace this uncertainty. One of the geophysical community's failures before the Tohoku earthquake was not emphasizing what we don't know. To whatever extent the Tohoku earthquake was unexpected, it was because the uncertainties of the ruptural history and plate coupling were not understood. So instead of going out and using a traditional solving method and producing yet another model which happens to fit the data, I'm instead going to go out and use Bayesian methods. And the beauty of Bayesian methods is instead of finding one model, you find the probability distribution that describes the ensemble of all models that fit the data. And Bayes' theorem from 1763 says that the distribution of all possible models is merely the product of the prior distribution, which is whatever your a priori constraints on the model is, times the data likelihood, which is merely the exponential of the least squares residual between the data and the output of your forward model, g of theta in this case. Notice that covariance matrix in the data likelihood. That's very important. The bigger your uncertainties, the bigger the uncertainties on the model parameters you get back out. And for something like the Tohoku earthquake with four meters of observed displacement, if you have a 10% uncertainty in your Green's function, you could have 40 centimeters of error. So when we do this modeling, we include uncertainties in our Green's functions as well as our data. So our model is merely a square mesh. For each patch, there are four parameters we solve for, two components of slip, the rupture velocity on that patch, and the duration of slip on that patch. And we use very broad priors because we're not trying to find a model. What we want to see is what does the data what parts of the rupture process are well constrained, and what parts do the data just have no resolution on? Thank you. So, on this plot, the teeny tiny dots that you can see are the locations of seafloor geodesy and uh, near shore pressure gauges. In addition to this, we have open ocean dirt um, buoys that give us tsunami data. We have static GPS onshore, and we have one horse kinematic data onshore. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over rupture velocity, and I'm not going to go over um, slip duration. They are there. They are consistent with the published models. This is our average slip model. And notice that it increases as you go out to the trench, and then it comes back down. And this is different from a lot of published models out there, and I'm going to come back to the importance of this later. Notice at the top, there's some random slip. You might be asking, is that a robust feature of the model? Well, that's exactly the sort of question you can answer with Bayesian analysis. So remember, this is just the average of all 500,000 models. It's just one model. So on this slide, the background color is the same as on the left on the previous slide. It's the average of all, all possible slips. Now, the teeny tiny little histograms on top of each patch, that's the distribution of, of slips that we get for all these 500,000 models. Those are all the slip values we've seen. And what you see is that there's this, high, this area of high slip that's very tightly constrained. The, the PDFs are very narrow, so that's a well-constrained feature. And it's also well-constrained that, on average, the slip goes down as you get to the trench. And then out here on the edge, you see much broader PDFs that often include zero. So no, that's not really a robust feature of the model. You could, not, you could also not have that slip there, or you could have more slip there. So here are the data fits to the tsunami data from the average of the posterior model again. Here's some GPS data. We also fit that quite nicely. Here's the seafloor geodesy. It's also fit quite nicely. Now, this is the one horse kinematic data, and I think it's worth talking about this in a little bit more detail because all posterior PDFs are pretty narrow. It's saying that we have a pretty small error on our model, and that's probably not true, and that's probably because we're overfitting that data because there's a lot of covariance in the seismic data. So anyway, coming back to this issue of having the slip go down near the trench, um, we can find this because we don't constrain our model, right? It's just go out, find me a bunch of slip models which satisfy the data. While most of the traditional models out there um, use smoothing. So when you're out near the coast, where your slip is very well constrained, and it's increasing as you go out towards the trench, and then you don't know what's going on in the trench, if you smooth, you just extrapolate out to larger and larger slips as you get near the trench, whether you need it or not. And you don't need it. We can fit the data without putting a lot of slip near the trench. We don't rule it out, because you can also fit the data with slip the other trench. So that's it.
Thank you so much.